Hi, good afternoon and welcome to our last session of Wonk Week. We hope you've uh, enjoyed the many great sessions and if you've missed any, we'll be sharing out recordings via email and on the quorum website, you can access anything you might have missed over the course of the week. I'm really excited to lead this session for all of our PAC peeps out there today. Um, my name is Claire McDonough and I'm a senior account executive at Quorum with a focus on our PAC product. Last year when Quorum hosted Wonk Week, we didn't have a PAC product, but last December, Decision PAC team uh, joined Quorum and we've been working hard to bring you a new PAC solution. So please be on the lookout for a future announcement about the launch of Quorum PAC. Um, our session today is going to be a conversation about how to leverage uh, employee resource groups into your PAC engagement strategy. Um, with the midterms right around the corner, I'm sure you are all starting to think about your 2023 and 2024 to-do lists. And if thinking about where your ERGs fit into those plans isn't on your to-do list, it should be after our session today. So throughout the session, uh, please uh, feel free to use the chat window to engage with your fellow attendees and to add your questions uh, that Michael will answer towards the end of our conversation. Um, and we'll have a few polls along the way to help drive our conversation as well. So with that, I am thrilled to be joined by Michael Kennedy, the Senior Vice President of Global Government Relations and Public Policy at VMware. Uh, Michael is the Senior Vice President for Global Government Relations and has led VMware's uh, global GR team since 2014. Uh, prior to VMware, um, many of you may have known him as the chief of staff for Senator Hatch of Utah, and he was uh, previously the vice president for federal and state relations at Utah State University and as a lobbyist at Lee and Smith. Thank you so much, Michael, for joining us today. We're delighted you're here, and let's just dive right into this topic. So. Um, to get us started, why don't you tell us a little bit about VMware PAC, and can you give us an overrule, overview of your role in managing the PAC and what your PAC team structure is? Well, first, uh, thanks for having me. I'm delighted to be here and grateful uh, to Quorum for the opportunity. Thanks for everybody for uh, tuning in as well, and I hope it'll be a good interactive uh, discussion. So thanks for uh, having me. Uh, VMware's PAC is not um, uh, huge, uh, like many who may be on this call, uh, and it's not tiny either. I think uh, I try to describe it as respectable. We're about uh, 250K a cycle, um, and that allows us to kind of participate and be out there without uh, it being all consuming. Uh, like many people who were joining us today, uh, it's it's been very um difficult to grow the pack and, and overcome kind of skeptical uh, employees within the company, um, especially given uh, recent political polarization and environments and, 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 and the like. But I view it as a, um, a critical tool for us and a strategic tool, and we try to be a strategic company. Uh, VMware, for those who don't know, you're in great company. Uh, we're, we're kind of the biggest tech company no one's ever heard of. Um, we're a software company that provides uh, cloud infrastructure and uh, cybersecurity and, and uh, uh, other kind of plumbing for uh, the cloud and the internet. So what has the 2022 election cycle looked like for you and how has it differed from past years? Yeah, we, you know, generally our PAC is a, you know, by mandate and by bylaw, we're a bipartisan, bicameral PAC. Um, so we've tried to always think about both sides of the aisle, both chambers, uh, both sides of the Capitol, and, um, and, and be strategic that way. Um, I think 2022 has changed um, in a sense because uh, we, like many people, took a strategic pause um, after January 6th uh, and, and some of the aftermath there. Uh, and we have, you know, ramped back up, but we're still kind of negotiating the, the 147 and, and other um, aspects that are, are part of that fallout. So um, focusing and talking a little bit more in depth about the original pillars of your disbursement strategy in a regular cycle, what does your disbursement strategy look like and how has that had to change or pivot over the events of the last two years? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. And um, previous to um, what I would say really was George Floyd's murder um, and and some of the events that came out of that, um, we were typical PAC 
um, criteria. Uh, it was very business focused, business outcome focused, and we had kind of three main pillars. One was we gave to people who represented our office locations and where we had uh, a lot of employees. We gave to leadership uh, in on both sides of the aisle in the Senate and the House, and then we gave to members of committees uh, who were relevant, had jurisdiction relevant to our core business. Um, and you know, once um, once George Floyd was murdered and people started paying attention a lot more to some of the ESG issues um, that surrounded political giving, we we received some criticism from our um, our ERGs uh, and some concerned employees about giving to uh, members who had an F rating from the NAACP, for example. And um, we had to explain, you know, on a couple of things. One that we don't follow scorecards um, in general because scorecards are generally based around votes and giving money for votes is the textbook definition of a bribe. So we had to kind of explain that we have to be very careful about how we qualify people um, to receive PAC donations. The other side that we emphasize is that I believe every Republican had an F rating um, from the NAACP, including you know members like Tim Scott and others. And so we um, kind of, it, it, the partisan nature of those, of some rankings, we were able to kind of say, listen, we don't follow all of these things because they tend to be partisan and we're bipartisan in nature. Um, the other thing that we emphasize is that what we try to do is we try to qualify and, and affirm some of these areas rather than disqualify in a negative way. Um, and, and I think as soon as you start finding reasons to disqualify people, um, it became evident that, you know, I can five, find 535 reasons uh, pretty quickly to disqualify probably every member of Congress based off of the thousands of votes and positions and tweets and other things that they do every year. Um, so after this happened, we, we did think about this and we said, okay, we want to listen to our um, our employee resources group. We call them pods at, at VMware, the power of difference groups, we call them. So if I say pod, uh, I mean ERG. Um, but, uh, uh, and, and so we said, okay, how do we include that these communities within um, our organization and how do we you know, get them involved uh, and, and make this a positive for VMware government relations, for VMware PAC and, and kind of get some energy behind that. So the two things that we did that were kind of transformational for us were one, we added every uh, pod leader to our PAC board of directors. Um, and we added our vice president of diversity, equity, inclusion, and our chief people officer um, to, the, to the board. Uh, and that effectively doubled the board count and the board was primarily our C-suite. Uh, and and uh, and then um, me and our head of public sector sales, and so it doubled the effect, the the size of the board, and and the pod the ERG members were pretty enthusiastic about. It. They were skeptical at first, so I don't want to learn what this means and things. But the ability to continue to have another platform to be um, passionate about their issues uh, was positive, and the executive exposure was also very positive. Uh, the the second thing that we did. Uh, is we added a fourth pillar to that giving criteria. And we said, okay, we can now qualify people solely based off of our values and what we call our 2030 goals. Um, and so we were then able to say, okay, this person, this individual may be bad in general on some of our business issues and whether it's taxes or you know trade or some of the other traditional business issues. Um, but if they're terrific on LGBTQ issues, um, that can be the sole qualifier for um, giving them a pack check. Uh, and and that those two things have been pretty transformational. Interesting. And so, so in terms of how their participation now on the PAC board has changed your disbursements and your disbursement strategy, is it been just finding those um, creative ways to allow to expand those uh, disbursements to other people that may not be an industry focused um, disbursement? Can you talk a little bit more about that? And what does that conversation look like internally if for, to the extent that you can share it? 
Yeah, listen, I don't think this is without risk, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and and so once you bring more voices in who have political um, positions and political ideologies and 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 the like, which is kind of mm -hmm. everybody, um, it it complicates the strategy behind what a government relations team is, is to be. Um, so we've had to have a lot of conversations um, with the board members to say, this is, this is a board, um, not an executive team for the PAC. Mm -hmm. And so we encourage them to give us thoughts and ideas and feedback, but we generally approach them on, hey, we think this member is really good on women's issues. Um, or we think these five members are really good on women's issues. What do you think? Who do you think would be, you know, the right people? Who, you know, do you want to look into their issues? Here's some tweets. Here's some, you know, bills they've sponsored. Here's some positions they've taken. Um, and and then we we get the feedback from them. We we don't really allow for a veto um, per se, um, and we don't just give a blank check over to say, hey, here's some money that you can disperse for women's issues or LGBTQ issues or black issues or Latino issues or whatever it might be. Um, and and so it's not a, they are not the executive. The, the GR team retains kind of that executive authority and the strategy behind it, but we look for them to be the advisors in that. How often do you meet with the individual pods to talk about uh, what, what's going on with the pack and to do education or to do some fundraising um, within the pods? And have you seen now that you have developed an engagement strategy with them? Has it increased your contributions from those employees at all? Yeah, and, and this has been kind of the win-win-win um, scenario mm -hmm. of this, is that it's allowed us to engage with them in many ways, and the PAC becomes kind of the initial conversation, right? They're now part of a board. They have to think through some of these issues. They have to get involved politically and, and think through the strategy as VMware in, in, um, in these areas. Most of the people who are our pod leaders, you know, are engineers or in the sales orgs or, you know, doing the different day jobs. And they don't think about um, what government relations does every day. Um, so we've been able to do that. The other thing that, that changed for us is um, uh, we have started, you know, before I, I talked about the size of our pack and how it's respectable, but not big. So we haven't really hosted to date a mm -hmm. lot of pack events we would attend a lot and we'd show up and we'd talk about our software and mm -hmm. the cool things that we're doing and how we're changing the world and etc cetera, etc cetera. but we didn't really host a lot of events the, the events we started hosting and there are people who i've seen the attendees who who have uh who've joined us in this and i'm i'm grateful to them for it is we we started hosting events that have been built around these issues so we'll approach a member and say hey listen you are a champion of the aapi community uh, and we would love to have a fundraiser based around your positions on championing the AAPI community. And we want to talk, we'll come in another time and we'll tell you about the cool things we're doing for, you know, software or medical devices or financial services or, or many of the things that, that um, other people do uh, here. But today we want to talk about what we as corporate America are doing ourselves to support our AAPI community. And we want to recognize you the member for being a champion for that community and we're all going to hand you a check saying you know please keep fighting like hell because because we recognize you we want to tell you what we're doing what we care about and for so, so for the member they love it because they're recognized for things that they're not always recognized for and things that are they're passionate about naturally um and it's not a run-of-the-mill fundraiser where it's you know people saying, you know, what's going to happen with tax extenders or, you know, how does the NDAA play out? And it's it's a different type of fundraiser and conversation. And then for then what we do is we invite all of the companies who attend to invite a plus one. So we will bring our pod leaders either into Washington for an in-person event or onto the Zoom to ask questions. And so these experts who are have these, you know, wonderful, passionate stories about how they got involved in leading the community at VMware or at the other companies that join us, they have these terrific exchanges. They get to ask a member of Congress you know, questions directly. 
Um, sometimes they get the selfie, right, if they're in town. And so then they go back to the to their ERG and they say, hey, listen, I was able to ask Senator so-and-so or Congresswoman so-and-so about this. And we had this, you know, terrific exchange and they liked our ideas and, you know, maybe they're going to come and talk at our other event. And 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 so they they get fired up and it gets the ERGs fired up. Right. And I think that the third win is that then for us as a company and for our CEOs and other executives, they get to say that, hey, listen, we're literally putting our money where our mouths are on these issues. And you know, we're not just virtue signaling or talking about things or sending a tweet. We're we're investing real dollars into some of these issues. And 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 so I think it's been a win-win-win across the board. So in terms of your pod um, structures, are the people who are serving on your PAC board, are they elected by the other members of the pod to serve in this capacity? And was their participation and contributing to the PAC part of that requirement? Or did you just let that happen organically? Well, we, we never require a PAC donation, oh. by, oh. <laughs> um, but it's, it's strongly encouraged if they want to kind of be involved that they are generally global um, pod leaders. Mm -hmm. um, and we've had to kind of think this through and it's evolved over time where we now have kind of two classes. We have we have seven pods and then we add an eight. So we have a, a black pod, a Latino pod, an uh, Asian pod, disability pod, pride pod, women pod, and veterans pod. And then mm -hmm. we add sustainability to that and involve our and our kind of ESG sustainability offices in that. Um, and so the, we've kind of created two classes. They serve for two years. Um, okay. uh, and and we kind of stagger the classes so that they're not all coming in at once and relearning. And then um, we we actually ask um, that those that that overlap to happen so that then you can when they're in their pod leadership, they generally are pod leaders for two years uh, when they're elected. And we ask one of those years to be on the board and then a kind of uh, emeritus year to stay on um, off the board, but on the pod so that they can train the new leader to come in. So that's taken a little bit of um, evolution and learning just when we had huge turnover for a couple of leadership areas and we were kind of starting from scratch. But it's been, again, generally very, very positive and the engagement um, uh, in the pack and then just understanding what government relations does is great because when they fly out for these fundraisers, we then say, hey, listen, we're going to be on the Hill doing these meetings anyway. Do you want to join us? And you can talk about, you know, the other things that VMware does. Uh, and, and so then they kind of get a, a better appreciation for um, just government relations as a function as well. So you've done a really good job of um, you know bringing them in and providing a good structure and getting them engaged and help and uh, putting some structure there, but how do you manage and navigate when they push back really strongly on a particular um, candidate? How do you navigate that conversation and what is your viewpoint and how do you get to an end solution um, decision about moving forward? Yeah, again, we try to get, we, we focus very, very heavily on this affirming and qualifying um, uh, idea. And, you know, we give examples of, hey, listen, there is a chairman of armed services who does not have a great sustainability stance and is kind of a climate change denier, right? And whereas we wish his stance on, on sustainability and climate were very different, um, we are qualifying him because of his position on armed services. And as, you know, one of our biggest customers and important for what we do, we want to engage with this member on those areas, uh, on, on the armed services area, and that's the solely qualifying area. And for some, that doesn't fly, right? And and they kind of want ideological purity um, in, in some of these areas. And, and if we've had blowback, it's about, hey, you know, I'm glad you're now giving to these people who with whom I agree. I still hate these people and wish you didn't do it, and I think it's wrong against our values or whatever it is. So um, that's always a challenge, I think. And if anybody here has figured out how to solve for that, I'm I'm all ears. Um, uh, but uh, I think um, what we again try to focus on is that affirming, affirmative qualifying idea and saying, and, and then when we give the justifications across the board, we tell people why we're affirming them. And with the, um, with the employee resource group kind of 
focus areas, that is generally the sole criteria that we give. And if they happen to be, you know, a member of another committee or uh, in leadership or something like that, um, it's a great, uh, um, uh, it, it's a great opportunity for us to kind of maximize that. But we try to focus on that sole qualifier um, because then it, it gets into that affirming side. But you know, it's not without risk on that side. Um, to um, our attendees, uh, if you look on the uh, where the chat is, there's a little button there for polls. We have two polls up and we hope that you will uh, take our little mini polls so that we can uh, get a sense of what uh, the two poll questions we have up right now is whether you have ERG representation on your PAC board currently and also whether your PAC has resumed contributions to the 147. Um, uh, we're going to start talking in a second a little bit about next steps and strategies um, going forward. And so those are some of the questions. We'll come back and we'll talk about those results in a few minutes. Um, so what do you think about in terms of next steps? Now that you have all of this here and you've done a great job of making this all happen during the pandemic when all of these issues have sort of come up, but how do you think that this is all going to impact things differently for the next cycle? Um, and how might the change in the control of the House and the Senate change the disbursement dynamic and your conversations you're going to need to have with your pods in the next year or so? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, one of those poll questions there is relevant to that, and it's the mm -hmm. 147. And if, you know, if it seems more likely than not that the House is going to um, be controlled by the Republicans, um, you get into a situation where, you know, is the is the PAC not going to give to all of House leadership um, and to many of the uh, chairman in waiting? Uh, and and um, I think that's a difficult strategic argument to make. Um, and so, you know, again, I'd be very interested in in the expertise of the people who are uh, attending this um, event to, to hear what their thoughts are, but we've started to think of and and give to you know select members of the 147 we've used many some of the tools out there that do some of the analyses that uh, um, show you know who's doing what and who's saying what and we try to you know differentiate internally around people who had concerns about voting irregularities in certain states rather than continued election deniers and things like that and and the nuances there but but again we go back into we are a strategic company the pack is a strategic tool as part of the government relations team and to ignore um a, a large portion of the congress um and disqualify them uh is probably not strategic and so, yes, we have to take all of these things into consideration. We have to put things on the scale and balance things out. But again, we're, we are trying to find affirming ways to qualify people rather than negative ways to disqualify people. Interesting. Um, and do you what, talk about a little bit about the transparency outside of just your employee resource group um, in terms of sharing with all of your contributors about your disbursements and your disbursement criteria. Yeah. And, and, uh, you know, that doesn't go, uh, you know, wide to the general public, mostly mm -hmm. because of FEC requirements mm -hmm. is that, you know, a lot of these things have to be, you have to be PAC qualified in order to kind of see a lot of the, the things that we put on our PAC website. Um, but knowing that, donations and disbursements eventually are filed and 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 become public we are pretty open about that and we try to publish the reasons and the, the qualifications that we use um, for these and so the um the, my terrific team uh here in u.s federal um uh thinks through those issues very carefully um and tries to say okay these are the reasons why we're supporting these members and and again when it comes back to these new board members who are vocal and who have a platform and can, um, you know, whip up employee sentiment um, pretty quickly, we we pre-socialize a lot of these 
um, discussions and saying, hey, listen, you know, here are two members of the 147 that we're planning on giving to um, this cycle. Um, here are the reasons why. Uh, and, you know, let me know if, if when we get into the board meeting, if you're going to have a problem with it, because I'd love to discuss that beforehand and resolve any questions or concerns you might have. And so it's allowed us to um, do the work that we need to do to pre-socialize these things, but it also enables us then to have many more points of contact with um, with our pod leaders and and to be able to uh, um, uh, you know have have better relationships across the board, which is I view as positive. How long did it take you to put together um, the new structure and between changing your adding some new things to your criteria and getting the approvals to add the pod representation. I'm thinking, you know, I think we've all learned over the last two years, there's so many things that will happen that you have no expectation that you're gonna have to manage. And I think everybody's learned a lot of adaptability and a lot of survival skills from that. But how is what we've all gone through the last two years and the emergence of the pods and the employee resource groups help prepare you for future challenges that are inevitably coming down the pike and you just don't know when they will. Yeah, listen, I, I, I think, you know, to answer your per first part of your question, I think conceptually it was very easy um, to get support for this. Um, thinking mm -hmm. through, you know, I know that some people have not added ERGs directly to their boards. Um, they've created separate um, kind of advisory panels. Um, and, uh, you know, there are reasons to do that, and maybe practical reasons and just kind of expediency reasons for how board meetings go and, and the decision process goes for different people's bylaws. For us, it was pretty simple to say, OK, you know, I, I think in the aftermath of, of Black Lives Matter and things like that, there was just such a will, a desire to make impact and to show that we're listening and that there is that VMware cares about these communities and that we want to have, you know, this not just be talk, um, but we want to walk the talk. Um, so conceptually, it was pretty easy to say, hey, listen, this is what I propose. This is what I think we should do. The practicality of then kind of going to the pod leaders and saying, OK, there's this political action committee and uh, here's what it is. Here's what it isn't. Um, you know, would you be interested in joining the board? And there, you know, some people were very enthusiastic and wanted to jump in. Some people were pretty skeptical and had to be um, convinced. So, you know, I think the the devil is always in the details on some of these things, but we, we were able to move pretty quickly because our CEO was engaged and um, there was a lot of support across the company for actually taking action uh, at that time. Um, I think in the future planning and future engagement and things that will pop up uh, in kind of the ESG world and, and, and the inevitability for what all government relations functions are now um, dealing with, um, I, I think it's prepared us in the sense that we now have relationships with these leaders. And so instead of, you know, the black pod leader contacting somebody, contacting the CEO, it's it's our friend Latrice who's contacting the CEO. And so I can now call Latrice and say, hey, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. And we have a relationship and we know each other. And there's just kind of a foundation of trust that we can then work on solutions for. And so, again, for me, there have been, you know, very little downside to this inclusion uh, within our PAC structure. Uh, and, and I think it has been a win-win-win across the board. How has, I'm interested in some of the, the conferences and other things where I've seen the this conversation happening, how has the emergence of the, um, of the pods and the employee resource groups and you're including them on your PAC board impacted other um, divisions within your organization, say your communications team or other things? Do other people look at this and say now, oh, this is a really interesting thing about how looking and getting the perspectives and the input um, from these representative, representative groups in terms of our communications and other things. Is this replicable? How are other people on your peers looking at this um, structure that you have in place? Yeah, and, and people may disagree with me on this, uh, but my feeling is that government affairs is turning more into corporate affairs. Mm -hmm. um, and that we can't 
you know, the, so some of those stakeholders that you mentioned, we can't mm -hmm. operate in vacuums or in silos um, uh, to, to deal with these things. And that talking to stakeholders, whether internal or external, um, uh, requires coordination between HR and communications and the ESG office and the office of the CEO and all those kind of things. And so it ends up being much more of a coordinated corporate affairs function, even though we don't have an official corporate affairs function, right? But it, but we kind of act that way. I think this has enabled that. It, it was easy for us because our chief comms officer, uh, other people were already on the path board. And so they knew where we were going with that. And it was just easy for us to coordinate that, but it becomes much more tightly integrated and allows us, again, the, the familiarity and the trust to, to deal with other issues as they arise. That's great. Um, why don't we, uh, let's talk about our polls. So it looks like um, currently 100% um, who responded, and I can't see how many people replied, but 100% uh, say they have resumed contributions to the 147. Uh, so that is interesting. And uh, it's a 50-50 split between folks who have employee resource group representation on their path boards. There's still time to take those. So let's, uh, you ready to open it up for Q&A? Ready for some questions? Absolutely. All right. Uh, folks, please go to the Q&A box and uh, send some questions our way. It looks like there was a question in the chat um about um feedback from consumers and customers about our donation strategy um uh if vmware is is not a super consumer uh facing company and it's kind of the one instance where being the biggest company no one's ever heard of may be an advantage um uh in that we don't you know no one gets famous off of our brand and, and beating up our brand or boycotting our brand i would say um we are careful, of course, about what our customers think. We are we we listen to them. We listen to people who use us uh, and and our products, and we care deeply about that. Um, but we don't get a lot of of feedback there. You know, sometimes we hear from people saying, you know, why did this member? Why did that? Why why that member? And specific individuals. Um, and we generally try to avoid um, uh, getting into you know, individual um, conversations about individuals. And sometimes I'll call, if it's an employee or something that I'll call up and have a chat about, you know, what the PAC does and what the PAC doesn't. Um, and that, you know, the team has a strategy over, you know, the four four pillars that we use. Um, but, you know, I, I'm probably not the best person to answer that question just because we're not a consumer brand. Do you have, what kind of listening posts do you have to track or hear what people are saying about your politics out in the, on the internet or on Twitter, or is it just really not a problem for all the reasons you stated before? No, listen, we track all of them and our comms team tracks it all. Uh, and, and even our internal Slack channels and, you know, we look for hot spots and all these kind of things. And, and again, what I would say is the, the risk is, is that you know, our strategy is not one of ideological purity, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I think if there are um, members of employee resource groups or um, other employees who want ideological purity, it, it's just difficult to deliver that. Um, uh, maybe you can deliver it for a pocket of the company, but there, you know, inevitably another pocket of the company will not like what you're delivering. And so we try to be, again, as strategic as possible and to um, to cover as many um, areas as we can as part of our strategy. Um, while we're waiting, hopefully for more questions, I'm going to ask you the question from the icebreaker. What was your favorite pack trip and why you ever went on? Oh gosh! Or um, hosted for that reason, potentially. Um, I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna take the easy out on this, and I'm just gonna say that our th these um, ERG related fundraisers that we've hosted uh -huh. um, have have actually been really really fun, and they sh they're just different, um, and it's a different conversation. The member shows differently, and you see a side. I mean, like we had. 
when one of the uh, women's events we did, the member and uh, some of our um, pod leaders were kind of crying together about shared experiences and why they got into politics. And, and it's, it's just a different um, situation to have non-GR people sitting around the table having a conversation about things that they're naturally, naturally passionate about. Um, and what I would say is um, I would be delighted for others to join us in, in these fundraisers. So if people are interested, um, feel free to reach out to me. My email is mkennedy at VMware. Um, and uh, I would I'd be delighted to um, include people. And you know, from, from the beginning, we knew that our pack wasn't that big. And we always thought that, um, uh, that this would outgrow us in a certain sense and that there would be other companies that would say, hey, I want to do a similar event for this member. And maybe VMware doesn't have the budget for that member, but if there are other people willing to do this and carry this on, um, you know, I, I just, I think it's a good thing for Washington. I think it's a good thing for corporate America. And it's a positive that um, uh, can be affiliated with PACs that in, in today's environment, it is not a positive generally, you know, people, super PACs have kind of ruined some of that, I think as well. But um, I think we viewed, you know, corporate PACs and there's acad academia around this, that they're moderating, moderating influence um, and they're an important part of kind of the political discussion. Oh, we have a question. And this is one that I have, I spent a lot of time personally working on uh, for uh, our clients over the pandemic. Have you considered letting donors designate which politicians they want to contribute to and sort of doing designations, designated giving? The answer is yes, we have considered that. And, and that actually has some roots in, in VMware's giving um, strategy in general. Our foundation mm -hmm. uses something that we call citizen philanthropy, where our foundation doesn't just give, you know, $2 million from VMware to, you know, girls who code or something like that. They, we distribute, um, dollars to every employee who have a, a certain mm -hmm. amount every year to give to whatever um, not-for-profit that they see fit. And they kind of view it as, you know, uh, mm -hmm. the million drops of rain equal the waterfall and things like that. And that, you know, th there will be ebbs and flows. And sometimes they, they get encouraged to, you know, here are some, um, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter related charities. Here are some other, if there's a natural disaster or something, here are places you can give. Um, but generally, that citizen philanthropy is something that is is kind of a core thing. In the pack, because we're so small um, or relatively small, uh, we, we've avoided that because um, what we've seen when we've kind of asked is some people will come and say, well, we should, you know, we should give to Bernie. And we say, okay, well, you know, Senator Sanders doesn't take um, PAC dollars. Well, you know, we should give to him anyway. And, and so it, you know, it becomes a little bit difficult in that. We try to listen, of course, but again, we want this to be a strategic tool and something that um, the government relations team is using as a strategy. And we try to get as much input as possible, um, but uh, but no, we haven't we, we haven't gone that direction yet. So um, I'm not sure if the person who asked this question was asking about specific um, candidates as opposed to designating. So this is one of the things I've we've worked a lot on with some clients, which is allowing them to designate that their PAC dollars only go to Republican candidates or Democratic candidates, as opposed to individuals, which has its own, its own special problems as well to, to administer. Yeah. yeah, listen, I think we could do that. Um, and, uh, you know, I, we've, t we've talked about that. Um, for me, it felt, um, from our end, it felt a little disingenuous because we knew we had a bi we have a mandate uh, you know bylaws mandate for bipartisanship and bicameralism and so if some if if they say oh you know say 90 percent of our donors say okay well we want to give to democrats then we would probably go to our entire c-suite who generally max out to the pack and we say okay we need you to designate all of your money to republicans just so we can have a balance right and so it it felt you know that decision on our side felt a little disingenuous um Right now, again, we try to be as close to 50-50 as we can. Um, right now, we trend, trend a little more Democrat uh, in our giving, and, and we trend a little more House to our giving, as you know, one would expect right now. Um, are there any final questions out there? 
And if not, I will uh, have any last final words or advice or um, ideas that you want to share with folks. Listen, I'm delighted that um, uh, I had this opportunity and, and ability to talk about this. If people are interested in, in helping and improving our process and participating in some of these fundraisers that we do, again, I'm, I am uh, very interested in, in hearing ideas and, and welcome um, uh, diversity of thought and, 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 and also participation in some of these things. So um, please reach out and, and give me the ideas. And, and again, thank you for the opportunity and, and thanks for people for tuning in. Absolutely, thank you so much for agreeing to be our a Wonk Week presenter. Um, and for all of you, again, we will be posting and emailing um, the sessions and stay tuned and hear more about Quorum Pack, which will be coming to you soon. Thanks so much, Michael. Thank you. Happy See you Wonk Week 2023, everybody.